Um, well, I can't find one. I don't know. I never thought about. I really don't know. Sometimes I, I think maybe it's to, to, to get it right. I think it's very fluid, but I think the purpose of life basically is to contribute to society in the best way you know how. Raise a family, have grandchildren. To make the planet a better place than it was previously. Connect with something that's bigger than yourself. To glorify God on a daily basis and to essentially work to um, kind of become our best selves that we can and fulfill that potential that God gave us when he created us. For one, to be happy and to and to make happy the people you have around and to tell them how much you love them. Maybe just helping another person. If I can help one other life, then that would fulfill my purpose. My belief is that I was created to worship Allah, or if that's the Arabic word for God. To live like a good life and just leave with some sort of mark on history and just have somebody remember me. Do our best to get to heaven is bring as many people as we can with us. Pursuing what you really want to do. There's not really a specified meaning or a specified purpose. I guess that everyone comes up with that for themselves. There we go. Good morning, everybody here at Sevierville. Give it up for our Greensboro campus on this Sunday morning. What's up? We got 20 people, 20 people, 20 states watching, including Washington, D.C. and Ontario, Canada this morning. From Tennessee, happy fourth day, 14th birthday, Ryder. Happy birthday. What's up? Pluett and Ruth Ann. How are you guys in Alabama this morning? Kimberly in Kentucky, Robin in uh, Minnesota, Jackie in California, Lisa, Illinois, Billy and Diane in Mississippi. Uh, Rick and Lisa in Virginia, Kara, Wisconsin, Michael in New Jersey, so many other people watching. Guys, we have literally probably 600 people conservatively watching online right now. Give it up for everybody watching everywhere. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you bring them, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 2. We start a brand new series entitled, everybody say it with me, The Place, The Pit, and the promise. Doesn't that sound so, ah, the place, the pit, and the promise. I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, Brent, that sounds awful churchy. For you, that sounds a little churchy. Uh, we're in church, so that should sound, anyway, it, it maybe sound a little too religious-y for some people. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you religious -y? Is that a word? I'm not a religious guy. I believe in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm a Christ follower. Um, you're like Brent. We're a part of the religion of Christianity. I would rather be considered a Christ follower that has a living relationship with the one who created me, who redeemed me, who saved me, and who knows me by name. How about that? That sounds good. Last night they kind of stood up and applauded, but I know it's, it's early on the morning. So we start a series, um, and if you're visiting with us, why do we do this? We teach and preach in sermon series. I don't like to call them sermons. Somebody walked out last night and goes, Brent, you don't preach sermons. You preach lessons. I like that. Uh, messages. And I like it that we can spend some time, not just one week, but lock in for seven weeks. We're going to lock in on this idea, the place, the pit, the promise. And it does refer to um, the meaning of life. Why do you get out of bed every morning? Some of you asked that question today. Why? Right? I'm like the Geico commercial. By the way, last week, some of our Greensboro campus knew this. Javon and I left last Wednesday night from church. We drove to Greensboro last Thursday. Javon, we drove her car, and uh, her front right tire blew out on the interstate, just the other side of the mountains, going into Hickory, North Carolina. I get out. It's 99 degrees on the asphalt out there. I thought I was going to get killed by people going 140 miles an hour on the interstate. It was baking me, and I got Javon's tire iron out. It's about this big on her little car, and I really just thought for a moment, I am the Geico commercial. Have you seen that commercial recently where the little Geico, he rolls it back and he's like, please help me. I have a flat tire. That was me. That was me. And so I asked myself that morning, why did I get out of bed? God, I'm, I'm going to Greensboro to spread the, the love of Jesus to people in North Carolina. And boy, do they need it. I love you guys. It was awesome. You ever thought about the meaning of life? 
I mean, I, I think we do. You're like, Brandon, that's really deep for early on a Sunday. The meaning of life, the, your place in this world, your purpose for living. And everything's going to kind of run through the Rolodex of your mind. I'll age myself when I use the word Rolodex. Y'all remember the Rolodex where we had teenagers like, what is a Rolodex? Is that a watch? That's a Rolex. Anyway, um, <laughs> when, when stuff like that runs through your mind, what do you think about my meaning, my meaning in, in this world? You realize what the video that we just saw was very confusing. You ask 10 people what the meaning of life is, you're going to get 10 different answers. To me, when you think about the meaning of life, what, what if the hokey pokey is what it's all about? Probably a good thing. Maybe you'll turn yourself around. I mean, it's... <laughs> Jay, come on. That was good. I mean, literally, you know people, they jump off a cliff to find the meaning of life. Then it hits them, right? That was, that was a high-level joke right there. A very wise, very wise older pastor who's kind of way above average and really good looking, at least his wife thinks so, once said in a sermon series, it takes a fight to focus on what's right. It takes a fight to focus on what's right. It takes a fight to focus on what's right. Some of you are like, who was that wise, old, beautiful preacher? You're like, at least your wife thinks so, right? Okay, I get it, I get it. And so I know this is churchy, but I kind of wanted it to be that way because I think this is really, there's so much to be said about this. We look for our place in the world. If we don't feel like we're there, we find ourselves in a pit. That pit really resonates because a lot of people feel that way. We live in a complicated, crazy, crazy world. Crazier by the day. We feel like, man, can it get any worse? We find ourselves in this pit. So the promises of God, a promise of fulfillment and meaning and salvation and hope, all those key words, which I don't know, matter a lot because we're all looking and searching. Whether you go to church or not, or you religiously or not, we're all wanting that. We're all wanting meaning. We want to know why we get out of bed every day. And it's getting tougher to answer that question for lots of people because we've misprioritized so much. I thought of entitling this series Life 360. I think that's a great one. Who has Life 360? If you're a parent on your smartphone and you know where your child who drives is at all times, oh, it is the best technology ever. My son's in the room and I love it. Man, I know exactly where he's at, how fast he goes, if he accelerates too much, if he brakes too hard. I mean, I'll ask him, I'm like, where did you go? He goes, I went to Chick-fil-A. I'm like, why did you go that way? I just went a different way. I went JL. Well, what are you doing that way? And I think to myself, every time I ask him, man, I'm glad my dad did not have that when I was a kid. <laughs> Some of you know, right? You're like, why did you park there? Well, it was called The Point. Anyway, uh, I thought of entitled it that because Life 360, it's, it's interesting that, you know, this idea of that little arrow button, you push it and on Google Maps or Apple Maps, we know right where we are. I wish it was that easy for us to course correct every day and go, man, I just lost meaning. Click that button. Oh, good. Now I found myself. And I've never really known people to do that. They leave families, and I've said that before. It cracks me up to, for people to go, well, I've got to leave my family and leave my job and leave my community, and I just got to go find myself. Have, has anybody ever done that? You just like trekked across the country, and you find yourself in a random Walmart in Montana, and you're like, well, there I was. I was right there in the electronic section. I found my. It never happens. But we're all in search of. We're all looking so what I want to do is this, and I need you to listen because this message can get deep. Um, honestly, this was, the message this week was one message, and I looked at it, I'm like, oh, it's like nine pages. There's a lot. I'm like, let's split it up. So I really split the one message I had to start into three. That's how we roll because I want you to not be so, bomb so bombarded with information. You're like, good Lord, when is this over? I want you to go, man, I want more because I want you to journey with me for the next seven weeks as we lock in on our place in the world. What does that mean? And if we don't really understand the beginning and we don't understand the end, we are going to live in a perpetual midlife crisis and we're there. If we screw up the beginning, which the culture has really done a good job, I'll explain in just a minute. If we don't really have any hope that, and any promise that there is an end, there is an eternity, there is a place that God is preparing for us, then there is not a lot of meaning. And I'll say it, you know, I'll say it in all kinds of love, and I need you to listen and pay attention to me, but uh, you are a moron. 
If you look at creation and you go, well, we're all, this just happened. A big bang happened. We're all just stumbled out. We're here. We have nothing really to live for. We all walk around. Everybody is working for the weekend. I mean, that's, that's life. Then you're right. There's not a lot of meaning. So a lot of, I'll use the catch words, and I think it comes on the screen. You can kind of see it inlaid. A lot of stress will occur and a lot of pain, depression, fear. I don't really want to use those words because we've been using them for the last year and a half with everything that we've been going through. But I do believe we need a foundational message, especially for my son's generation. If you're a parent in this room of a teenager, you know what I'm talking about. Man, it, 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 is, it is difficult to be a teen in the world in which we live, a younger person, especially with social media and they're trying to find their place in this world, their footing, what are they gonna do, what is the meaning of life and we really identify with everything but what matters. We think our place in this world is where we are, the community which we're a part of, which is true geographically. Some of you are like, I'm a country boy, you can take the boy out of the country but not the country out of the boy, I get it. Some of us as parents, that's what we identify as, we're parents. Some of us, man, it's all about our community, our school. I'm a Smoky Bear. I'm a Seymour Eagle. I'm a Northview Cougar. That's a, I don't know, I shouldn't have said that. That's weird the way I said that. What else? I'm a GP Highlander. I mean, that's, that's not the right way to say that either. And I think that's, that's what we, we think. Well, you know, as guys in this room, what I, my meaning, my, my, my purpose, my place in this world is for me to make money for my family. I'm the breadwinner. I do this. But is that, our, I, is that what it's about? Is that our meaning? Even for me, is it, is my, I'm, a, I'm called to be a pastor. I believe that. I believe I am in my place in the world when it comes to my, my occupation, my career, if you want to call it that. I don't really consider this a job. I consider it a calling. But if this is what I identify as my place in this world, that when I stand up here and you guys go, Brent, that was a good sermon, then I feel good. Or you go, Brent, that was not a really good sermon. Then I find myself in the pit, which can happen. If that's it, then I, th I think we're missing out on God's best. So a long time ago, a guy named William Shakespeare said the, these words, all the world's a stage, audience participation time. Do you believe that to be true? Yeah. All the world's a stage. William Shakespeare, some of you know who he was. Then he would go on to say all men and women are merely players. We're mere, merely supporting actors and actresses in this drama called life. And it sure is a drama, isn't it? Everybody say it with me everywhere. Drama, 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 Right? How many people would consider life a drama? Raise your hand. Who would consider your life a comedy? <laughs> what about a comedy drama? Hallmark movie? Not very many of us, right? All the world's a stage. All the men and women are merely players. And I like this. Along with everyone who has ever been born, you and I have been cast as supporting actors in life. We were not cast because of our great abilities, some of you are like, Brent, you're right about that. Uh, there are no casting calls, talent searches, or even screen tests. We're only given a part to play in life. I like this because the author of life wanted us to experience the joy that comes from truly knowing him. William Shakespeare, when was he, when was he around? Did he die in the 1950s, 60s, or 70s? Anybody? <laughs> Somebody last night, the 60s. No. He was around in the late 1500s. I think he died in early 1600, like 1615 or something. Don't quote me on that. But it's interesting that William Shakespeare would say this, and everybody looks at William Shakespeare as this incredible, creative, just theatrical type person who wrote screenplays and all these great poems and all that. But 40 years before Shakespeare said these words, a guy named John Calvin said these words. The universe is God's majestic theater. John Calvin, the leader of the Calvinistic movement, better known as in this culture, the Baptist movement. Uh, he was an author. He was a theologian. He was a pastor. I believe a lot of John Calvin's teachings have kind of been jacked up through the years. And really, if John Calvin would come back to life today, he would probably be like, what is a Calvin? Because uh, more than likely, a lot of what people attribute to him, he's kicking the end out of his casket. But he made this statement, and I think it's powerful. It's interesting that he said this 40 years before William Shakespeare said it. Hmm. 
Wonder if William Shakespeare plagiarized John Calvin. You have eyes, plagiarize. Because it is true. You know what? All the world's a stage, but you've got to understand this, and here's the beginning, and this is what we're after today. It's God's stage. God created us. God created places and spaces for his entire creation. And we, we own that. It's common sense. We understand that. But yet we need to realize all the world is a stage, but it's God's majestic theater. We were created with a place in mind and a purpose. And you're like, Brent, I know that. I heard that. It sounds wonderful, but it's true. So how did I get to this series? I like to tell you this because this is how God works. Some people ask me all the time, Brent, do you just sit around and pray all day long that God would uh, speak? Yes, but God also is a very creative guy in my opinion. God is the author of creativity and you just never know what creative thought hits you and the direction that we need to go in the time in which we're living. Pastor Matt walked in my office in early May. I didn't exactly know what we were going to do after the summer road trip series, but Pastor Matt bounded in my office like he would do. Hey, buddy. You know, Matt. Everything's new money to Matt, and so we got to stop today. It is Pastor Matt's 43rd birthday today. Today. We as a church are fortunate to have Pastor Matt Samler on staff, leading our youth ministry. It's a complete God thing. And I think everybody that knows Matt would say that. I mean, we all need to applaud Pastor Matt and his team because he is amazing. Amazing, amazing. Yes, sir, I love it. I'm standing with you. Two-man way, two-man way. So now I can pick on Matt. Matt walked in my office and he said, hey, Brent, you see this Netflix movie? Robbie, have you seen this movie? Called A Week Away. And I'm like, no, Matt. He goes, it's a Christian high school musical. I'm like, awesome. Matt's a Broadway guy. Robbie is not necessarily much a Broadway show tunes guy. I don't know. Maybe you are. I don't think so. But Matt is. Jay will laugh on from Matt's a Broadway guy. He loves it. Pat, um, let's, let's pick on Pastor Matt. This really happened. My wife and I were walking in a movie theater one day. We were going to see The Greatest Showman. Every night I lie in bed. I don't know how the rest of the song goes. Visions of sugar plums in my head. I don't know how it goes. So guess who's in there by himself watching The Greatest Showman? Pastor Matt. I'm like, Matt, what are you doing in here? There's nobody else in here. So Javon and I sat, sat next to Matt. Actually, Matt and I sat next to each other. There was a dude spacer in between. And I'm like, Matt, why are you in here by yourself? He goes, Brandon, this is the fourth time I've seen this movie, and I love this movie so much. My wife's no longer wanting to come with me, so I, I came by myself. <laughs> And I honestly, you ask him, it's true, I noticed at the end, and it's such a Broadway, you know, you've seen it with Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron, and, and he, he's crying at the end. I'm like, Matt, have you seen this four times? I know. I'm like, you are weird, buddy. <laughs> so, of course, when he walks into my office and he goes, Brent, have you seen this movie a week away? It's, it's a Christian high school musical. They go to a summer camp, and they use these Christian songs, and it's awesome. And I'm like, no, I haven't. He goes, you got to watch it. Because I, I, like, I like Broadway. I love these kind of show tune type. These, these high school, I loved High School Musical. You're like, why did you even tell me that? Now I'll never unhear that. <laughs> hey, my daughter was young. Don't judge me. So I watched it. I went home and I said, Javonna, we got to watch this, this Netflix movie a week away. She's like, a week away? A week away, a week away. Anyway, I'm like, what are you talking? No, I'm like, a week. It's kind of a weird title, right? Have you seen this, Jay? A are you kidding me? And I, anyway, a week away, and I watched it. And after the fourth time I watched this movie, I binge watched a movie. I watched it like three times that night. I'm like, this is great. They used Michael W. Smith music. They used Amy Grant music. They used Stephen Curtis Chapman music. All these great Christian artists. And it's perfect. And not give too much of the plot away because I want you to go home and watch it. It's a pastor-endorsed movie for all ages. It's on Netflix. It is incredibly good. What a great plot. This boy, you get it right up front at the beginning of the movie. He's an orphan. He lost his parents. He has a choice to go to juvenile detention or to summer camp, a Christian summer camp. And he goes to a summer camp, and check this out. What an original plot. A boy meets a girl, and they fall in love. <laughs> Haven't seen those lately. But it's amazing because their stories, and you watch it, they intertwine, and they're asking themselves this question. He asked this question throughout the movie. Where's a place to really belong? I'm looking for my place in the world. And so the song that Scott just sang 
We just sang it here. I know we sang it in Greensboro. We, um, it's a song from Michael W. Smith. He just sang it called A Place in This World. It was written and, and released in 1991, 30 years ago this year. Some of you remember Michael W. Smith back in the day. How many people like Michael W. Smith? This was back when he had long, flowing mullet hair. He had his little piano in the desert. Looking for a reason, roaming through the night to find my faith in this world. My faith in I mean, I, I like Michael W. Smith. But listen to the lyrics, and this is where we're going to jump into Genesis. Listen to this, and you think of our, my sons, you think of our, our society today. This song should have been written today, even more than 30 years ago. The wind is moving, but I am standing still. A life of pages waiting to be filled. A heart that's hopeful, a head that's full of dreams. This becoming is harder than it seems. Feels like I'm looking for a reason, roaming through the night to find my place in this world. Not a lot to lean on. I need your light He's talking to God here to help me find my place in this world. And I like the second verse because I think this is the cynicism of our world today. If there are millions of people down on their knees, among the many, God, how can you still hear me? Hear me asking, where do I belong? Is there a vision that I can call my own? Show me. And that's where a lot of us are today. A lot of people struggle with their place in this world. Quotes that I found. I like this one. I think this is true. This is a little funny, but it's, it is true. I found my place in this world. Thing is, I don't have enough money to buy a ticket to go there. We think it's geographical. If I could just go ease in Belize, right? If I could just go down to the Caribbean somewhere and be like Kenny Chesney, who's a country artist but lives in the Caribbean. That's a little strange. Uh, uh, this is where we are. Sometimes I feel like, you know, maybe my place in this world is to check out and just go live up in the mountains and build a log cabin, live off the grid, whittle wood. But this is, this is where people really are. And I have a feeling we can all see ourselves in these quotes. I want to find my place in this world, but I don't even know where to begin looking. And I think a lot of people are there. I'm struggling to find my place in this world. The thought that I might never feel I belong anywhere scares me to death. There was another quote I didn't put up there, and I should have put it up there. And you might not, you might raise your eyebrow when I say this in church, but uh, somebody else put the exact same quote. The idea I'm struggling with finding my place in this world, the thought that I might never feel like I belong anywhere, and they said, scares the hell out of me. And I thought as a pastor, good. Maybe that's what you need to really prioritize and understand your place in this world and what that looks like. And it's not what you do, it's who you are. A lot of us feel like this fish out of water. Sometimes I feel this way. Has anybody ever felt this way before? Maybe you go on vacation. We had that conversation in the summer. You go on vacation and you're, you've had enough. You feel like I'm ready to go home. I don't feel like this is where I belong. You've ever been to a family reunion and everybody's jacked up but you. You're like, I feel like a fish out of water. Some of us feel this way in life. When we start a new job, maybe with first-time parents, we're like, what's going on? There's no manual. Lots of people feel this way. And I want to illustrate this because it's interesting in Genesis chapter 1, God is going to create all things. This, this, everything that you see in the world in which we live just didn't happen. God created all things. And God himself takes pleasure in creating places and spaces for his creation. He separates light from darkness, Genesis 1. He separates land from the sea, the water. And he, in his creation, whether it's animals, whether it's fish, we get it today because a lot of us are really sensitive about this. We look around at the world in which we live, and there are a lot of animals that are becoming extinct. There's a lot of habitats that are being knocked down, um, especially the pollution of man in the ocean, whether it's the rainforest, and we all get upset, which is okay to get upset. To go, Man, those poor animals are losing their habitat. They're losing their place in the world. And you see it, right? A lot of people, especially with bumper stickers, you see those people that have those animal-loving bumper stickers. And that's just an indicator of me. You, you don't like humans. You love animals. And if you had your choice, would you hang out with animals or humans, you would hang out with animals. But it's interesting, right? We get this idea of this fish out of water, that God created a fish in this habitat. If you go home today and if you have a goldfish in a bowl, 
If that goldfish decides he's tired of being in his little bowl and he wants to jump out of the bowl and land on the carpet and play on the carpet for a while, what's going to happen to the little goldfish? In just a few moments, you will be taking the little goldfish into the restroom and you will sending him home to his watery grave. We get this on so many levels, but we don't understand that we, and I don't think we do anymore, we don't understand that we are different than the rest of God's creation. We as human beings are created in his image. And more than a physical place in the world, which we all can choose where we live and what we do and all those things, it is a spiritual lordship issue that we start with. And if you don't get this right, you lose meaning. You don't understand the why, and then everything else becomes meaningless. Life is good when it's good, but when it's bad, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a pit, you're like, man, what do I do now? So let's go back to the beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I want you to look at a place, a moment. You know this moment. I'm not going to call it a story because I don't like that. I don't like Bible stories. This, this is a moment that I believe to be factually true. I stand on this when it comes to faith. I believe this is the anchor of my foundation. And boy, there's so much to be said when you have an anchor and you have a foundation. Even in the midst of pits and circumstances and storms and trials and tribulations, you have something to hold on to and you know it to be true. So listen to this moment, and it's a, little, it's a little deep and a little brutal, but I want you to see this moment because from this moment, we struggle as a society. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, the Garden of Eden. Who's never heard of the Garden of Eden? Okay, good. All right. And there he put the man he had formed. Who is the man? Who is the woman? Eve. Eve. He put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's an interesting thing. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. I want you to look for a minute and think about it. God created a place for man, his crowning creation. He created a garden that would sustain life. He allowed animals, he allowed trees and sustenance and all those things for the man to have and to really understand that, man, this is where I belong. This is the place that I belong. Adam and Eve had that place. The Lord God commanded the man and woman, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And a lot of people today in their cynical world go, I don't know. We've heard this story. We've heard this, 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 this thought But really, we were created different from all the other creations. We were created with a free choice. And if you don't have a choice to do right or wrong, then you don't have a choice. It's like taking a multiple choice test, and the only answer in every question is A. Well, that's easy. A, A, A. Hit the old staples easy button, right? Well, that was easy. But choices are to be made in life. God created us with a free will. He created us, and he told Adam and Eve, this was not a tree, and I think I have a picture of a tree. I just pulled up a picture of a tree. This was not some tree that was distant. It was off on some mountaintop somewhere. It was wrapped around barbed wire. They would have to dig a hole to go under the ground and skirmish along the ground to go to this tree. It was right there in the middle of every other tree that was pleasing to the eye and good to eat. And God's simply like, listen, you have all of this, this place that I created for you. Just don't eat from this one. Why did he do that? So free choice would be there. We're different from the rest of the creation because we have a free choice. This tree represented free choice. And I like this, and I didn't say this last night, and I need to say this because it's critical. This tree is important to our created place in this world, and it has more to do with lordship than some physical location. 
Would Adam and Eve honor their role as the created and not think they were all that and they were the creator? Their place in creation before God. Or would they trespass and know the pain of loss? They would understand the knowledge that not only good can bring, but evil can bring. And I think that's where we are. What happens is, you know the moment, most of us know the rest of the story, that Adam and Eve would be tempted by Satan. There is an enemy, and we'll talk about him a lot throughout this series, that would say, listen, why don't you rise above the creator? You are the creator. And that's what we struggle with today. Let me tell you, when you look around the world today, and you look at all of our lives, and you see where we're at and how displaced we feel, and we have no meaning, and we wonder why we, uh, we get up every day, and all of the things that we do that are mispractical, prioritized, you can almost sense that we have a godlike complex and we want to take control of our, our situation. Our, 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 somebody wrote this the other day. I, I just read some blog. It's interesting when you type in, find your place in this world and the internet wormhole will open up to you and you will get sucked down this wormhole. And somebody actually said this. This is their, their take on the meaning of life and their place in this world. They simply said, buy dirt, buy real estate, Organize your life around your home and your real estate. And then, check this out, you will have total control of your life. How, how dumb can, can a person be? And they lived, I believe, in California. <laughs> the land of earthquakes. I thought I had total control of my life when your house goes sliding down a hill, right? I mean, that's the dumbest thing ever. We want to have total control. There is no way that you will have total control in life. You can feel overwhelmed, even with the stuff that you do. You can have all of the world today, and it can be gone tomorrow. And Adam and Eve chose poorly. You know the moment, and this is what happened. God did not want this to happen. He did not want them to have the knowledge of evil. That's not why he intended it, but because he created us in his image with a free choice, they choose, chose poorly, and then all of a sudden, verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And you're like, well, that's a weird verse. Some of you are like, I've seen some people naked that I shouldn't have seen naked, and some things you just can't unsee. Like I was driving along Egmont Key. Remember when I jumped, fell off the boat and I drifted around and there's an island next to Egmont Key down in uh, the sun coast of Florida right there off the Skyway Bridge and it's known as the Nude Beach. And all of a sudden I had to do a double take as I was floating by and I looked at a few people and I'm like, are they naked? And all I thought to myself is none of them should have been naked. But anyway, that's a, that's a <laughs> message for another time. This verse is kind of... This verse is kind of brutal. Look what happens. So the Lord God banished Adam and Eve from the garden to work the ground for which he, Adam, had been taken from. The Lord God does something. There's truth in life and there are consequences. And he said, you cannot eat from this tree. If not, there will be consequences. God banishes them from their place that he created for them in this world. After God drove man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, angels, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. We're all looking for life. I like this quote. I don't believe people are looking for the meaning of life as much as they are looking for the experience of being alive. From that moment in God's word, from the very beginning, this is why we are who we are today. We all have been chasing the place where we belong. I might, might it should have entitled the, the message, the series, Chasing the Place. We're lost in place. I thought about naming it lost in place, but then I started thinking, no, nah, it sounds a lot like lost in space. And I didn't know if we could really get there with some remake Will Ferrell movie. So. But a lot of us are. We're lost in place. We're, we're chasing the place that we belong today. And here's what I want you to know as we kind of roll through time. If you fast forward through history and the pages of redemptive history begin to turn, we see a creator at this moment in time that could have deleted us off the screen. He could have washed his hands of his crown of creation and said, no more. But a God who created you loves you. 
we see redemptive history turning. Our creator begins to really become our redeemer, our savior. And this idea of love, the Bible is Route 66. It's God's roadmap for living, but it's an incredible love story about a creator loving his creation. If you go all the way to the New Testament and you see the pages of redemptive history turn, you see this verse of scripture, and this is what I'm after, and this is how we'll close week one of this. In order for us to find our place to belong, we have to understand that someone took our place in order for that to happen. Paul would say, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now listen, remember the tree of life and the life I now live in the flesh I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. Can we say that? In the Son of God, someone who took our place that we will find our place, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the place to belong. Today, we search for all kinds of substitutes. It seems like that's all we do to find the meaning of life. It's our identity. It's what we do. It started in, really in, in grade school for most of us. We found our tribe. We went into the sports arena or the band arena or the choir arena or the whatever arena, all those things that we identify with. And then we grow up and we find our little tribes and our little communities. And that's who we identify with. And that is our place to belong. But when it's all said and done, it's really this, this moment in God's word that we began to chase the place, that we walked away from the creator we walked away from lordship and what Paul is calling us back to and, and Christ is calling us back to all of these years later is simply that. You know what? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When you find that, when you seek that, when you really surrender to that, then you find that place to belong no matter how the winds are blowing. I'll close with this. Most of you did not know my dad. A lot of you that even knew my dad when my dad was around, especially the last 10 years of his life before he died five years ago, dad struggled with his health. You didn't really know my dad. My dad, when I was a teenager, when I was my son's age, my dad was pastoring in Florida. And my dad was, he was like an A-type personality on steroids. My dad was a hard charger. He would charge hell with a water pistol and figure it out on the way. And so for me, I was a preacher's kid. I grew up a preacher's kid, and, and I loved my dad. I loved his preaching style. I think my style is a lot different, my mom would say, than his style. He was definitely ahead of his time, though. And for a preacher's kid to say, you know what? Your dad, man, he did good. He kept my attention. He preached the gospel, all those things. It's a big deal. Hopefully my son would say that about me. Typically I go home and I say, hey, Mason, how was the sermon today? Good. If I get a, hey, that, that was pretty good. If, it, if it's a pretty good in there, I must have did awesome. If he goes, it was good, that means, oh, the, the creative stuff was good. And the music was fantastic. Yeah, it's good. But my dad, people would ask me, hey, hey, Brent, what do you think about your dad? You're a preacher's kid. This was back in the day. I would say, man, my dad literally, I love my dad's preaching because dad would literally light himself on fire and we would all come watch him burn. That's what I used to tell people. Dad would preach, by the way, for 60 minutes. Like, good Lord, when's it over? But I never felt that way about my dad. My dad had some epic sermons. One sermon in particular was this sermon. My dad did a whole kind of, his. I, I guess it was probably top five, in my opinion, of everything that I remember um, of my dad preaching back in the day. He was a motivational speaker. But dad got rolling into this one particular paragraph one week, and it turned into a long series and a long thought in our church. And dad would just simply, he started by saying, there is no place quite like this place. Anywhere near this place, this must be the place. That was the name of his message, long title. And for like a half an hour, all he did was, there is no place quite like this place. Anywhere near this place, this must be the place. There is no place. I mean, he went for a half an hour saying the same thing in different ways. 
I thought by the end of that service, people were going to jump up and buy a bunch of Amway. I mean, they were ready to roll. He got people fired up. And what was he talking about? The church. He's like, there's no place like this place anywhere near this place. This is the place. So guess what? My dad did what I do to my son today. I get home from church. Dad's like, what'd you get out of the sermon today? What do you mean, Dad? You said the same paragraph. We, this is the place. There's no place quite like this place, anywhere near this place. This must be the place. He goes, what'd you get out of that? I'm like, the church is awesome. That's where I learned it. It's, this is the place. Dad, awesome. Good job. Lives are changing. Loved it. He goes, no, Brent, what did you get out of that? And he stopped, and the preacher got, uh, the pastor's kid got another sermon from the preacher after I heard the sermon of the Sunday. That happens a lot. Ask my son. Yep, that does. And he goes, Brent, it's more than church. The place that I'm talking about is God's will, especially for you. It's not what you do, it's who you are. Brent, don't get out of God's will. Don't forget God created you, and God redeemed you, and God loves you. It's not what you do. I can't get caught in the trap and the identity of just what I do and how I produce. It's God who created you and who redeems you and who loves you. And God who created all things, who redeemed man from a choice that they made, who now has sent his only son to die on a cross and to rise again and conquer the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And God, through his son Jesus Christ, is preparing a place for us that we will spend eternity. Brent, don't forget that because there is a place called hell that people will choose to go. And the God who loves us doesn't want that to happen, just as he didn't want this to happen to Adam and Eve, but a choice must be made. And are we going to choose and honor God? Are we gonna understand the lordship of our creator and our redeemer? It's a free choice that we've been given. Brent, don't ever walk away from the place because there's no place like that place, anywhere near this place. That's, That's the place that you want to be. All these years later, Man, I think of dad like all the time when it comes to that phrase. And that's true. I love our church. This is the place. This is the table of truth. The truth is right here and right now. The truth is God created you. He loves you more than you love yourself. He sent his only son to save you. He's preparing a place for you. And if you live for that, you surrender your life to that. Guess what? Jesus is totally right. You seek first the kingdom of God and everything else works its way out. Should you have a great career? Yes. Should you make the biggest difference you can? Yes. Should you be a dog lover? Yes. I had to throw that in there. Yes. All those things are good. But I'm telling you now, that's not where you find meaning in what you do. It's who you are. And you are a child of God. You are a son or daughter of the living King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the place where we belong. So journey with me. Take the next seven weeks. Remember, we're here to build believers and serve seekers. Remember that, that a lot of people need Jesus because life is good. It's okay, but life has not been great for a lot of us lately. And people find themselves in a pit. They struggle for the meaning. That's when we can introduce them to Jesus because Jesus is who they need more than ever in life. God, be with us today as we close this message in a different way. Be with all of us from here in Sevierville to our Greensboro campus, to our online campus family. We're watching literally kind of the four corners of the United States and beyond. The place we belong is not just geographically where we are, but it's spiritually in your arms. It's spiritually in a place of promise. It's in this place that you have created for us. And simply, we are to show you lordship, to honor you by the way we live our life and how we think about life. When we look around, we know that we are the crowning creation. And that doesn't have anything to do to puff our chest and go, look at us, look how awesome we are. We are simply supporting cast. The universe is your majestic theater. And we are fearfully and wonderfully made and loved by the one who made us. So when the storms come, and it will, We know that Jesus Christ is there for us. Your love is there for us. No matter what we go through, may we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray.